We'll start out by saying that you are tuned into Local Motion on 91.3 WVKR, Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. Please subscribe to the Local Motion name, to the Local Motion Facebook page and YouTube page by that same name. Now, let's get today's guest on the line here. Eric? Yes. Hello, you're here. here. It's it's always a really good start when I don't cut somebody off, so thank you. (laughs) I feel the same way. <laughs> you know, it's like technology sometimes is a little bit crazy. I'd like to do a brief introduction, if I may, by start off sure. by saying, highly regarded drummer, producer, composer Eric Parker has performed with countless musicians, including Bonnie Raitt, Joe Cocker, Steve Winwood, Ian Hunter, Lou Reed, Mick Taylor, Orleans, just to name a few. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm yes. I'm very happy to welcome you as a first time guest here on the show, Eric Parker. So a warm welcome. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I really am so happy. I know what we talked a few months ago when you were at Colony, and and it was just like, yes. man, your stories were just so damn cool. And I'm like, I got to get this guy on the show. So I'm glad that you <laughs> agreed to do it, and um, I'm I'm very happy to have you here today. I always start off. I always say like, this is your life, and I go back in time a little bit, and I always like to hear where musicians get their start in mu- music. Yours is a very yes. unique story because of your father and your brothers you yes. you grew up in um in staten island you were born right and then you moved to mount kisco before eventually settling in carmel that's correct yeah yeah yes yeah. Yeah. yeah so tell me like your start and <laughs> your recognition of music coming into your world well you know my dad was is really still alive at 95 and an artist uh, but he always drummed on the side, and uh, always a f- great fascination with jazz. We had jazz music going on in our house all day long. In fact, to wake us up for school, he'd often blast jazz and start drumming downstairs in the music room. And, you know, you just start feeling really silly lying around in bed with all that excitement <laughs> downstairs. <laughs> it, was, it was better than any uh, any alarm buzzing or anything like that. So, but... Um, Really kind of brilliantly between the kitchen and the rest of the house was our music room, which was a, at one point a dining room, but we expanded the house. And But everything in that room was a drum set, a stereo, a piano, a stand-up mace. I think for a while we had a xylophone and then a, a handful of other woodwind instruments. My dad played sax a little on the side, so we had a soprano sax and that kind of thing, I, a clarinet as well. But that drum set was one set for Dad, me, my brothers, my older brothers, Chris and Tony, uh, and my younger brother, Nicholas. So oftentimes after dinner, we would literally race to the drum set who got, who got done first. If your chore was to clean the table, hurry up, clean up, and then get on the drum set first. Uh-huh. So I, I think part of having just one set and all of us made us very eager to get our our time on those on on dad's drum set uh and then of, of course as years went by and music became bigger and bigger um you know we got more drum sets in the house chris bought one and then we started putting we had a large house three floors so at one point we had let's see dad set downstairs two on the second floor and two on the top floor <laughs> so love it one uh one year, I remember our, our mom brilliantly gave us all headphone sets, so <laughs> we wouldn't be, you know, there wouldn't be five different types of music going on at the same time with everyone trying to drum over it at the house, so uh, it was very fun. A lot of art and a lot of music growing up with that, and a lot of kids from school would come over to our house to visit after school and, and jam and sit in with us or just look at the artwork. It was not unlike you know, it was very much unlike anyone else's house. You know, mm-hmm. they had generally, you know, suburban homes and that kind of thing. To have this house full of, you know, instruments and artwork and oriental rugs. We also were raising sheep, so we had, a, you know, whatever, probably only about 10 or 15 sheep, but well, still, we called it kind cool. of an art, an art farm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, to this day, I can't eat, I can't eat lamb because of our love for sheep and oh. um, that kind of thing. But, yeah, so Dad really was responsible for it. And then my older brother, Chris, was very uh, in- impressionable by me, by, I mean, an impression to me um, from his drumming early on just sounded so, so great. 
and uh, we started doing gigs uh, around town with uh, I sat in with him once uh, he he got uh, a double gig at one point and um I had to sit in for him. I think I was 13. Wow. And I remember coming home, I made $110, I think. That's big and money at 13. Home, totally. And I, I, uh, I came home, and I remember um, getting home around, you know, pretty late, 11.30 or 1, and my dad and my older brother Chris came upstairs to my room, and they, they saw me. I had all the 20s and 10s laid out on my bed like oh. a Monopoly game almost, and uh and Dad said, "So you doing a little count basie up here?" And I said, "Yeah." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, I'm counting what I." And I, I said to Dad, "I said, you know how many Heath bars this would buy?" Oh, you know, oh, man. I was thinking in terms of uh, amounts of candy, not you know, I didn't hadn't really. I was only thirteen, so right. Uh, but yeah, it was a great house to to grow up in, and <sighs> uh, uh, quite quite magically, after we left that house, uh, the actor Edward Herman bought it, who was a big. Uh, became a friend of my dad's and a big fan of his artwork. So kind of ironically, after he, we moved out, he moved in, but he bought a lot of the artwork. So it looked like our house when he lived in there, too. Wow. And and where we'd did you to, guys move and, after that? They moved to, uh, I had moved up to Woodstock, and they had moved to Washington, Connecticut, mm-hmm. um, which was, you know, very quiet postcard town in Connecticut. And then uh, eventually, my dad now lives in West Cornwall. Uh, my mom passed away, I think, six years ago now, but she mm-hmm. lived in uh, Ridgefield, Connecticut, mm-hmm. at, a, at a nice retirement, uh, you know, assistance home kind of thing. Beautiful right. uh, spot. But, yeah, uh, that was the, our growing up was just, you know, you felt silly if you weren't drumming or doing something musical or art, art you know, something in the art world of some kind. Absolutely. So and all now did. all your brothers, how many brothers do you have? Lay it out there. <laughs> I have four four brothers. Uh, we have one uh, quote unquote dark horse, Jeff, who doesn't drum. Uh, he does. He's a professional artist who does illustration for the New Yorker and London Times and all kinds of other things. And he does play slide guitar uh, with an interest, but not with a professional interest. You know, mm-hmm. uh, he's. He's quite good at it, but uh, the rest of us all drum Amazing. in some manner or another. So, yeah, Chris, it goes Chris, the oldest, Tony, I'm the middle child, and then uh, Jeff, um, and then the youngest one is Nicholas, who's, you know, now at our age, the youngest one being maybe, I think Nicholas is 56, maybe, something uh-huh. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you yeah. know what was really cool? When was it? You tell me. It was maybe two years ago where you had the Parker Brothers extravaganza I saw you guys at I think you played Bearsville but I saw you at the Falcon yes yes we've done it uh, I've thrown uh, with the help of everybody um, uh, three of those so far one at Bearsville in 2011 I think and then the Falcon one maybe whenever well you remember when you were there maybe five years ago is it already we did mm-hmm. Something maybe three years ago. <laughs> I'm not, I know I'm I know. bad with time that way. Me too. Me uh, too. And then, uh, and then last year, last July third, which was, by the way, one of the luckiest moments. We we got right between right when the initial COVID was done, mm-hmm. and the new one hadn't come around. New no new uh, strains had been born yet or known about. So that one July third to about July eighth. It was, everyone was out, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, there were people still masked, but we had a, uh, Lizzie said we were just something like 26 people short of a sold out crowd, which wow. was great wow. for that last one. And it was really fun. And I, I love having an event where we can have all the brothers, you know, the idea came to me years ago when I thought, gee, before we're all gone and it's too late, we ought to all play together and have, a, have something that we could all drum on the same stage. You yeah. Know? Even, you know, so it's been a lot of fun. And, and then um, to have your dad there, too. Have you guys ever recorded yourselves like that? Well, we did a, D- a complete DVD of the first show at Bearsville. Everything recorded and filmed that way. So. Nice, nice. But we haven't gone to the studio, per se, just the live performances, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that kind of thing. But but right. still a lot of fun. And, you know, it's great. The, the one you saw, we invited uh, the Levin brothers. So, you know, I wanted to be, you know, brother-to-brother yes. show because... Uh, I've been playing with Pete a lot, and I had done a lot of records with Tony. I thought, this is a natural. And by the way, just as a footnote, Tony Levin flew in from San Diego, Chile, that morning, showed up at our sound check, took a power nap, 
dinner and then came back and, you know, played his butt off at the show. It was Amazing. quite incredible. Amazing. You know? Amazing. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, he's so he's incredible. a he's a he knows how to travel all over the place. So I'm guessing he knows how to adjust yeah. his jet lag and how to work around that. But that was just such a beautiful show, and it was just so nice to be a part of it. And um, yeah, really really cool. Right. I hope you guys get to do that again um, with your dad because that was pretty special. Um, I would I would like to do one more. It yeah. would be fun to do one more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, Eric, Thanks. your First, I mean, yeah, drums in your house, that's what you did. When you got to school, did you play other instruments? Did you ever do anything besides you said, okay, I'm going to be a drummer and that's it? Were there other instruments that interested you? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I took up clarinet. Um, I was doing drumming at home, and I was the clarinet, uh, of the amounts of clarinet players in our, in our band and in elementary school way back, uh, were, there, were, there weren't enough. So our and there was you know fourteen drummers all any kid wanted to drum so um, I didn't really let on that I was drumming at home I just played I was you know working at clarinet which my dad also played mm-hmm. he had one at home so I thought this will be you know I'll learn it but at one point I told my my band teacher Mr Carfiello um, is there any way I could just switch to drums and he said God, we need you as a second chair clarinetist but. You know, if you must, and I said, I would just feel more comfortable. I feel like I'm not getting anywhere with a clarinet. And it was a great moment for me. He said, uh, well, can you roll? And I, you know, doing a drum roll. And I said, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, and he said, go show me your roll. And, uh, and I rolled. And he said, all right, your first chair drum. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I went that later that week. I had, it was so scary and embarrassing, which was I had to do solo snare drum for, um, you know, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Well, you know, where they're doing the whole uh, America the Beautiful kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget what it was. One of the giant uh, USA songs, um, you know. It was probably America the Beautiful, but I had to roll through the whole thing. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I think it might have been just a Pledge of Allegiance, but I had to roll. Once you knew I could roll, I had to roll for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and, uh, it was, uh, it was, I really got myself into it. But anyway, it was, it was fun. It worked out nicely. Uh, they wanted me, uh, my older brothers assigned me to be the guitarist in the band. They figured, well, Dad's a drummer on the side. Chris is a drummer. Tony's a drummer. You know, you should really play guitar. So uh, they, a friend of ours, Jim Vickery, brought me down to Manny's, and I bought a, a $13 guitar acoustic with case. Damn. And a pick. 13 and a, bucks. Yeah. For, uh, and I got through the page or two of the Mel Bay book. And then again, I went, ah, oh, man, it's just, I just always felt so relieved going back to the drums, something that was much easier for me to do. Mm-hmm. I still play guitar a little on the side, and... I still know all those first two pages of the chords of the Mill Bay book, but that's about it, you know. Right, uh, right. I took a keyboard with me on the road because TV goes off in, in Europe at about 8 o'clock at night, generally. Right. I mean, they probably don't as much anymore, but back in the 80s with Joe Cocker, we'd come back from the show and there'd be, you know, TV on for a minute, and then I'd get out the, my Casio and headphones and and just start writing songs there to, to entertain myself oh. and kind of self-taught myself piano That's, doing it that way. That is so cool. Now, I love yeah. the name of your first big band. I think you said you were 19 years old, Rhinestones. Oh, yes, the, the fabulous Rhinestones. That was with uh, Harvey Brooks, who is, I don't know if you know, is quite quite famous. Uh-huh. Uh, he, has a, he has a current biography book called uh, View from the Bottom that's excellent. Uh, I bought one from him. He moved to Tel Aviv, but yes, that was, uh, that was a band. Um, you know, I, it's funny, I was in a band in Ithaca that was part that some of those guys became part of Orleans. It was a band uh, with friends of a band called Buffalongo, uh, and they eventually became Orleans at some point. Some of them did, Wells Kelly and whatnot. But those guys were, were playing around, and we used to play some of the songs from the Rhinestones. And the keyboard player, Bob Leinbach, said, remember that band, the Rhinestones, that we used to do that song? It's here. They're looking for a drummer. And uh, we have a guy up here in Ithaca, but, you know, if you're interested, I said, I am. And then about two weeks went by, and I called Bob back, and I said, uh, anything happened with that band? And he said, it's kind of incredible. You called. He said, we were on our way down there, and we got into a car accident, and then a big argument. And I realized I didn't really want to be in a band with this drummer. He was as good as he was. He, had a, he was sort of a tough attitude. So, uh-huh. yeah, come and, 
come and join me, you know, the ride zone. So my, I didn't drive yet, so my mom drove me up and dropped me off, and then we, we played with the rhinestones. And uh, just as a footnote, which really altered my playing, uh, I was very nervous because I was so young. And Harvey Brooks had played with Miles Davis and the Doors and Electric Flag, you know, so he was really a professional. He was very nice to me. And after we played, he said, uh, this will work. He said, uh, do everything you're doing. Just keep a backbeat in there. We'll be fine. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, Easy enough. And, uh, I've, yeah, and he, he was he was right. <laughs> That's so, anyway. so cool. And then the doors yeah. just seemed to have opened up for you. So what happened after Rhinestones? Well, the Rhinestones, because I was with Harvey, we became a bit of a rhythm section package. So John Simon hired us for some records, and we'd... Harvey would always, you know, bring, I was actually living with Harvey at the same time, uh, so we'd all, you know, get in the car together and go to different studios and, and do that kind of thing. And then one by, Harvey was in a band with John Hall, so one thing led to another where, um, uh, you know, there was people who were mixed between two bands. Actually, how I ended up in the John Hall band was, Almost as interesting a story, which was I was in a band, a throw together band we had named Orion, which was two guys from the Rhinestones, the Rye, and two guys from Orleans. So we became Orion with Larry and Lance Hoppin and me and Bob Leinbach. Mm. And we played down at the Chance, and Bob's car broke down. And the next night, John Hall's new band was playing there, his first solo band. So we decided while his car was getting fixed, we would just stay and, and hang out and watch John Hall's group. And when I watched him, I thought, you know, Bob kept saying, you're so much better than that drummer, you should really let him know. And honestly, Rita, I went after that gig like nobody's business. I had, you know, <laughs> I, I kept calling John. I went up to Pierceville Studio with a, with a cassette tape of my, me playing, and he wasn't there, but the drummer was there. And the bass player I knew, and he was like, Eric, what are you doing here? And I'm, you know, very embarrassed. I'm like, uh, I was, I just wanted to bring a tape to you know, to play for John Hall. Uh, well, he laughed. And then I called his home. And, uh, and I said to John, I said, well, I was trying to get your tape. And, and he said, well, I thought you were playing with Larry and Lance. And, you know, I don't want any trouble between the Orleans guys and me because he had just left. And I said, no, no, that was just a, a throw-together thing. And, I, and he said, well, uh, we're going out to Chicago now. We're, we're out on tour with Little Feet. And I said to him, I said, well, listen, if your drummer gets pneumonia, uh, you know, give me a call. I would love to do it. I'm definitely free. And about three days later, I was down at my girlfriend, Amy Fraden's uh, um, room at NYU, and the phone in the hall rang. And they said, it's John Hall for Eric Parker. Oh, my gosh. Went, how did that, first of all, how the heck did you find me? Right. In NYU form. And then... Uh, I get on the phone, I went, hi, John, what's up? He said, hey, Eric, um, our drummer got pneumonia. And I went, what? <laughs> and he said, no, I'm, I'm actually kidding, but I, I would take you up on your offer. I think that's a good idea. And I went, oh, wow, okay. And he said, could you grab my record up at CBS and then meet me at my house back up in Socrates tomorrow night and we'll play? And I said, sure. So we did. It all went well. The next night I was at the Orpheum opening to Little Feet. And um, and uh, they had been out on the road for four or five days, and uh, one of the best lines, I didn't hear it, I wasn't there, but John Hall told me, he said, uh, that Lowell George came up to him after the gig, after the set, and said, what did you say to your drummer? You know, because he didn't know, he had changed drums. He just knew it sounded different, so it was kind of a neat moment for That me. is a neat uh, moment. But, wow, wow. Yeah, so that... we... Yeah, we did the power record. I played on No Nukes with Carly and James and all that stuff. So it really, and then more records with John. We it became a John Hall band, a quartet. Uh, but yeah, it was really a lot of fun. That that quartet backed up Bonnie Raitt. That's the Bonnie connection. Was wow. at one point, I think Bonnie's record company wouldn't didn't want to have to pay for her whole band to come from the to the East Coast. So. Yeah. For a couple of years, we would be her East Coast band, like three or four different albums. We we would do her promo tour here, you know, with us guys. And right. Them. Oh, oh, what a what what a, what a she seems like a lovely lady. I I've, I've never met her, but um, man, oh, yeah. she's just totally. a badass. She really is. And uh, yeah. oh, she's so much fun too. I mean, she's really uh, you know great fun to play with. A real one of the guys kind of woman, but she's you know really classy and really knowledgeable and a great player yeah. and uh you know a lot of, of yeah really fun person i wish her 
you know, the best of luck. She's even when we were playing with her, you know, she had a she had a really good following back then. It wasn't like hit record kind of following, but she definitely had a major, you know, um, a major following. We right. had a lot of shows right. with her that were, you know, Hartford Civic Center and big places. You know, it was for Greenlight. We did the Glow Greenlight and a couple other records in that era. Nine Lives, or something like that. Um, we were going to do a record with her. It just never happened with me. John, John, of course, has done records with her. Uh-huh. My older brother, Chris, did her, her first or second record. Chris played on her record, Give It Up. He played on a couple tracks on that way back. Oh, wow. um, I think that might be her second record. You guys must be yeah. like the six degrees of separation with the Parker brothers. Between all of you, you've played with everybody out there. I know. It almost <laughs> feels like that, doesn't it? There's there's one person I haven't played with. I've seen a lot. Always wanted to play with. I've played with his band members, like as close as you could ever get with actually never actually playing with, which is Jeff Beck. Oh. Um, you know. He, you know with what? Clapton and Winwood and he, <laughs> Dude, he, him. he's coming to Ulster Performing Arts Center. Oh, really? It's, I, it, I, I it, should definitely go. <laughs> you should definitely go. It's not officially announced, but I can publicly say it because it was on the billboard of the Bardavon, oh, and cool. I was there this past weekend and to see Graham yeah. Nash. And Beck is going to be, it's going to be officially announced, I think, next week. And he'll be at UPAC, at, I think, October 13th. So, uh, hey, maybe oh, give wow. a call, man. You can maybe, you know, maybe his drummer will <laughs> yeah, get pneumonia. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that'd, be, that'd be amazing. I know he's using uh, Anika Niles now, which is, a, a, I think she's German. She's very good. A uh-huh. uh, drummer who's a technician drummer. You know, his music is a little more technical than I would normally play. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm more of an R&B drummer and a rock R&B drummer. I mean, if it, it got into odd, complicated times and that kind of stuff, I'm not that kind of an athletic style drummer, you know, like Vinnie Caloyucci, who he uses, is just incredible that way. He's right. powerful, you know, I can read music, but I don't really go for that, what, no, what, you don't really, it's not called prog rock, do you know what I mean, the, where it's hard-edged jazz, you yeah. know. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I know what you mean. I forget the, I know yeah, what you mean. That, that style, but uh, I would definitely go see Oh, yeah. No, I I mean, how can you not? He's in Ulster County. How can any of us not go see Jeff Beck? I don't know how yeah. that show is not going to be sold out in minutes after tickets go on sale. So um, I saw him at the Fillmore East way back when oh, he first wow. started. I, you know, as a as a record, you know, as a musical lover like you are as well, it was one of those great moments. I, I got the Truth Beck, Jeff Beck album, Truth. That day I saw in the Village Voice they were playing at the, at the uh, Fillmore East. And I went, oh, my God. So it was the quickest turnover. Hear the record, love the record, go see the band. And that night, <laughs> so it was all. Oh, <laughs> and I, I must tell you, as a quick footnote, is that for three or four songs, Rod Stewart didn't come out and sing. You could hear him, but he was off stage. And years later, we were in Copenhagen doing a, a, a tandem tour with Rod Stewart for, I don't know, we did probably five or six dates with Rod when I was with Joe Cocker. And at one point in Copenhagen, the bottom of this hotel was a, a, um, a casino, basically. And we were playing blackjack and whatnot. And there was one or two tables left way off in the corner. And me and the guitarist from Joe Cocker went back in there and sat there. And wouldn't you know it, that Rod Stewart and his band came and joined us at our table. And after a few hands I and hellos and introductions, I said, sort of under my breath, I said, you know, Rod, I saw you... Uh, Back in New York with the Jeff Beck band, uh, you didn't come out on stage, and he yelped. He couldn't believe somebody someone, would remember. Yeah, yeah. And someone he finally met. Someone was at a show, <laughs> and he yelled the rest of his band over, like, "Guys, you know, like they hadn't believed him all this time. He was at the show. I didn't come out. You know, and it was kind of funny. I was quite, a, you know, quietly between myself, and it just erupted. Oh. Uh, but he was. He was very nice, and it was true. He said, I, I was so scared about playing First Film Where East and in New York, and it was sold out, and it was packed, and I, I just couldn't get out. I was getting nasty looks from Jeff to, like, get out from behind the amps and get on stage right, with us. Right, right. You know? Wow, anyway, wow. My, and you were there. I love yeah. that. I love that. So I have to I have to get into the, this big story. So I, I have three of my favorite top male vocalists are Louis Armstrong, Ray Charles, and Joe Cocker. And yeah. Yeah. you 
or lucky enough to be with Joe Cockers in his band for how long? Oh, uh, let's see. Like end of 83 to almost the end of 88, so yeah. whatever that is. Oh, yeah. Five yeah. years. Five, five years. years um, I, yeah. I read the story of how you got there, but I don't want to tell it because I want them to come from your words. How did you get to be touring with Joe Cocker? Oh, that's one of those. Now, I'll, I'll tell anybody, any musician out there who's thinking of trying to do something, often follow your first instincts, and something may not, it may not be the result you thought it was going to be, but it might be something else, and maybe better. And now that's the case of the story, which is, I called Michael Lang uh, to see if I could find a place to drum, because at that stage, my daughters were both, you know, kind of two and maybe one and a half years old, and they were either sleeping and I shouldn't drum, or if I was drumming, they would be kind of all over me, and we'd play around, but I wouldn't much done. Anyway, um, I called Michael, and he called back, and he said, I said, Tapoos, is that place available? And he, he said, I don't know if there's electricity in there, but I'll, I'll call you back and, and, you know, let you know. And I said, ah, thanks, Michael. That would be a huge relief, just so I can, I just need a midwinter bash for a few days would be great. So, no, I, I understand. I'll call you right back. And he did. He called right back. He said, well, I have good news and bad news. And I said, well, I'm a bad news first guy, so yep. lay it on me. <laughs> he said, there's no electricity in that place. I went, ah, oh. all right, well, I'll, I'll look for another place. I'll try to find a place, you know, with heat or whatever, or, or I'll find a, you know, but thanks so much, Michael, for looking. He said, wait a minute, do you want the good news? And I said, oh, sorry, what's the good news? He said, do you want to play with Joe Cocker? Wow. And I went, uh, sure, when? And he said, pretty much immediately. <laughs> um, and I went, yeah, uh, what do I got to do? He said, could you be at SIR tomorrow night for a quick rehearsal? And I, he said, there's not going to be any auditions. Uh, he said, um, because, he said, you don't drink. And I said, no, I don't. He goes, good. He said, because the other drummer, who was a great drummer, B.J. Wilson from Proco Harem, him and Joe would go out every night drinking a lot. And Joe would, you know, was, it was starting to wear Joe's voice out mm-hmm. and his health. And they'd have to find him in the morning. Oh. So oh, Michael shit. Lang it was becoming a huge hassle to find him to get him to the airport. So I was, you know, I was sort of thrown in his relief. Anyway, the greatest part of the story is, is that Friday night I was at SR. Saturday I was, you know, still in New York. Saturday night we flew out. Sunday afternoon I was in Tel Aviv at this giant soccer stadium playing with Joe Cocker. Unbelievable. First time. Unbelievable. Yeah, and now, Michael like, Lang was <laughs> the manager for Joe Cocker, right? That's where that... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, right, very right. Much. And if listeners aren't familiar, Michael Lang was also like the guy of, that put on Woodstock, the original 1969 festival. So we can like yes. connect all those dots. And of course, he just recently passed away. Um, yes, yeah, Un- unbelievably, surprisingly. So I, I, I really couldn't. You know, uh, it's a very sad. Very yeah, sad. such a great guy. And I mean, no, he didn't have to do anything. He had to do you know, that kind of thing for me. Hey, you want to play with... I mean, he also had managed my first band, the Rhinestones, so we knew... I knew of Michael back then. And we would, you know, when I was with Joe Cocker, when I was playing, we would hang out. We'd ski, we were horrible skiers. And we both discovered we were so bad <laughs> that we'd go skiing together up in <laughs> Bel Air and, like, you know, end up in the woods upside down and all these crashes and stuff. Uh. And... Uh, there was our little secret, trying to, we never tried to get better, but it was just something to do that was non-musical, it was fun to hang out. He was great to hang out with, totally, you know, zero attitude, zero chips on their, speaking of which, all those sort of famous people, Bonnie, Steve Winwood, they're, they're so nice, mm-hmm. you know, they, they don't have any chip on their shoulder, but I don't, I don't think I've seen any of them ever lose their temper at anybody <laughs> at oh, any man. moment. That's nice. That's you know. nice. You got lucky. You got lucky. So, yeah. Very. So, so yeah. Joe Conker, then you get this gig five days later after the phone call, and there you are playing with him, and you guys yeah. traveled the world, obviously. Oh, yes, everywhere for, for years and years. You know, it was kind of nice, too, Rita, because when I was a kid, my dad had a friend, Hal McCusick, who was a CBS saxophone player and a sports car and a beautiful wife, and he'd come up to visit us. And we had a friend who was a successful poet, Peter Kane Dufo, who had a beautiful farm and a writer and a more, you know, sort of pastoral style of life. And my dad asked me, what, what do you want to do? You could do either. And I remember thinking of Hal McCusick and his sports car and the, his beautiful wife, and the, I said, I'm going to do music. I said, what I, what I really want to do, Dad, is music and travel. 
And I, I've had so many moments of, you know, looking at a hotel balcony from Sydney, Australia, going, well, <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm playing music, but I'm traveling. Right. So, yeah, it made, made me very happy. And Joe went on to do, you know, we have many uh, all over Japan, Australia, many times in Europe. By the way, in Europe, he was so, he was like Elvis in Europe. Mm-hmm. You too opened to us in Europe during their Joshua Jeez. Tree tour, like their their biggest tours. We did co-bills with them. We also opened to them on a night or two, but in Germany, nobody could touch Joe Cocker. I mean, really, Tina Turner added us to our tour because her ticket sales were slow in Europe, and so we became her opening act, But uh, which was fun, too. Um, our background singers were Ikeettes back in the 70s, so they all, they all knew each other, and her... I think her sax player, uh, Wayne Dyer, became uh, part of, sorry, Derek Dyer became uh, in Joe's band as well. In fact, her management took over Joe's management when Michael Lang's contract went up. So, wow. But yeah, Joe, Joe Cocker, great singer and great guy to hang out with. And, um, and one of the guys, you know, he'd be offered a limb on, oh, I'm going to get on the bus with everybody, uh. you know, which was really... Uh, you know, I said to him one day, you know, what do you do for electric? He said, well, I'm a gas fitter. That's my per- that was my profession before I'm a singer. So I said, out in Santa Barbara, you did your own gas? He said, sure. I hooked up my own gas for my own house. <laughs> I was like, I just thought that was so cool. You know, <laughs> you know he's just one of my expertise <laughs> that I know how to do. Uh, he was a drummer first, a joke, uh, Cocker's Comets, it was called. And there's a, he had an old publicity picture of him behind the drum set. Um, so he had great rhythm and a great sense of everything, you know, great yeah. soul. Yeah. Sense. We well, did the, a couple shows with Ray Charles, double, oh, you know, whoa. Get at out. the same time. Now, he was, I know Joe Conker was influenced by Ray Charles, right? Very. Yeah. You know, and Ray says Joe Conker's the only singer, he, white singer he likes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and that's a that's a quote. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. And that's same for Bob Dylan. You know, Bob Dylan said, Joe Cocker's my favorite interpreter of my songs, my mm-hmm. favorite voice. Mm-hmm. And that's why he'd come to the rehearsals and hang out and and that kind of stuff, you know. so it's Just it's soul. I mean, the guy just had soul. You know, you look at Joe Cocker, you look, you look at some of the YouTube videos, and the one that you sent me, I brought tears down my eyes. I mean, just yes. a soulful guy, just the real deal. There was no BS. You know, it, at least it didn't oh. feel like it. You know, and yeah, never, never, nothing. He and by the, he really maintained uh, such great character. You know, um, in that sense, he wouldn't do endorsements. He's not going to sell out. You know, if someone like Zucchero, when Zucchero first started, he would try to. He would come up and hang on our dressing room and drink all our beer. <laughs> and then come up and sit in for a couple songs. He wanted to be Joe Cocker so bad. And Joe would go, okay. You know, he would let him be that guy. And uh, he'd come out and do a little help from our friends with us and that kind of stuff. But uh, I think he's a big... I know David Sanchez just toured with him a couple years back. So he's... Zuccaro, I think, is a pretty big name now, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You, are you familiar with that? I'm name, not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. But that doesn't mean much. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's mostly Europe anyway. So right. I don't think he ever got that big here. So, right, anyway, right. Yeah. And it's weird. Yeah. Sometimes over there, the music scene is a little different than it is over here. Now, before I forget, yeah. is there any place on the planet that you've always wanted to play that you have not? Oh, wow. Good question. Um... Gee, let me look at my map. <laughs> Take a look had, at the globe. One, yeah, I've never been anywhere in Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I would love to play at Madagascar because the mm. animals and the plant life are so unique and interesting there. Mm. Uh, that I've never been to. I've mm. never. I don't have much interest in India. My daughters and my ex-wife went to India and stayed there for about four months. Wow. But that culture doesn't fascinate me like it does others so much. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. Um, I've never been to Alaska. Um, Beautiful uh, place. So that, yeah, that was, I've been all over you know, South America. I was very fascinated with. And we, when Stevie Ray Vaughan died, uh, with Mick Taylor, we, we, it was funny, we had just come back from Japan. I had one day off, and then I got a call from management. Are you ready to go to South America? Stevie Ray Vaughan 
just died and we're going to take over his slot for this Clapton tour. Oh, and of course, I said, sure, you know, so we, we left. And um, <laughs> by the way, like a little 10 year old, it was about a 22 hour flight down to San Diego, Chile was our first stop, our first stop from New York. And uh, I don't know, seven or eight hours into it, I realized I'd never been up to the cockpit of a jet. So I asked the stewardess if I could go up there. And uh, it was great fun, actually. It's getting, you know, it doesn't have all the, it, you know, it smelled like B.O. and coffee. Right, you know? right, such tight quarters. And that's when you could ask nowadays that would never happen. But um, No, absolutely not. Right. And, yes, that's a very good point because luckily we were we were traveling before any kind of terrorism or any of that kind of stuff had mm-hmm. happened. You know, there was... You know, uh, I mean, we were with the Bob Seger tour. We were having fire, bottle rocket, firecracker wars in the hotels. <laughs> you know, people in the management going, could you guys just keep it down a little? There was right. no, like, police <laughs> or anything, you know. But that's a, that's a good question. I guess if I had an, a one place to answer, I'd probably say Madagascar. Just, I've been to Tasmania, Australia, um, but that... Africa fascinates me. I've had a, I got this, my mom used to say, I got a really good luck from, at Africa from Spain. I could see Gibraltar when we were in Spain uh-huh. and in, around Europe, but um, right. yeah, that right. was, I, I would probably go there. <laughs> really, really, really uh, amazing. Yeah. A lot of people I ask that question to typically say Africa and um, it's, it's unique. Yeah. It oh. is. Yeah. I, I get, cause yeah. I asked that cause I always like, People like you, you've traveled the world, but really there's a spot that you must not have hit yet. So now we have yeah. our answer. Now t- tell me about composing, because you've written quite a few songs. Um, some of the tracks that you sent me are co-written. When did you start writing songs? I started when I was on those tours with Joe Cocker was when I got really into it, because I had this portable Casio headphones and kind of taught myself music. And then, you know, you're playing Joe Cocker songs every night, but then me and the bass player, John Troy, uh, you know, he asked me one night, you're going back to your room, what are you doing in your room? I said, oh, I'm just writing songs. Hey, can I come by? Sure. So then we started writing them together, but I get, uh, I get in- inspiration a lot and um, um, for, for song ideas. I can kind of hear them in my head and think, oh, that would be great. If-. So then, you know, as years went by, I got more serious writing them down and recording them and you know, uh, voice messages in my phone or whatever way I can, any way I can. I was just doing that yesterday with a friend co-writing. But uh, some of the, some of the best ones, the one I sent you, Ramona, I dreamt that song, um, <laughs> which was one of the best ones I've ever. I was in the dream. I was at uh, Silas Rhodes, who was the president CEO of School of Visual Arts. And a good friend of my dad's, and he often had huge summer parties. And and uh, at this in this dream, we were in this beautiful tent, afternoon light, and uh, and Paul Desmond was playing with Dave Brubeck. And in the dream, I, I said to my dad, I said, "Listen to that melody Paul Desmond's playing. That's beautiful." And my dad said, "Oh yeah, she's known for that, you know." And that was more or less the end of the dream. But when I woke up, I realized I had made the whole melody up. Uh, I was in the shower, and I jumped out of the shower, got onto the Wurlitzer, played it before I forgot what it was, and then that was that. It's on a cassette. But what made it a real turning point was about four days later, Cornell Dupree called me and said, uh, I want you to the next record. I'd done the one prior. And I said, oh, man, that's great. He said, Eric, I got a question. Do you have any songs? And I said, I just, <laughs> I just came up with one. Man. He said, well, bring it to the studio. So then uh, I had demoed it so everyone could play it. And in the studio it was me and Willie and Paul Schaefer and Michael Brecker, and, um, and, we, and we cut it. Now, Paul Schaefer is doing the Letterman show every night, and we had three days together doing these basic tracks. So the first day we did Ramona, and uh, it was kind of amazing. The next day Paul came in and said to me, he said, Ramona wins. And I went, <laughs> well, Ram- my song, Ramona, what does it win? And he goes, well, it wins because... It's the song I woke up singing this morning. After, and I said, did you do the Letterman show? He said, I did the full show last night. Uh, and I forgot who was, uh, uh, Patty Austin was the guest. We had blah, blah, blah. He said, but I woke up singing your song. And I went, oh, that's, man, that's incredible. Uh, by the way, just on a fly on the wall, I had to show him the piano part, which was pretty hilarious. That's me, hysterical. Me Paul Schaefer Paul Sha- yeah. I was playing. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so, yeah, we recorded it. 
And then one day, my friend called me and said, they're using it for the Newport Jazz Festival theme, you know, and he, he, uh, he told me the radio station was on, and there it was, uh, my melody, uh, come to the Newport Jazz Festival. Oh, man, and, uh, that's, so cool. that's so cool. That's so cool. I know, what a- <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And you also had a top 40 hit, right, with John Hall Band, Crazy? That's right. Yeah, Crazy. Uh, Crazy Keep On Falling. That song I'd written with that same keyboard player, Bob Leinbach, who was in the Rhinestones. We, I actually wrote that with him in the Rhinestones uh, about my girlfriend at the time, Amy Freight, because I kept leaving and going on tour and then coming back. And, you know, we'd get to that point of realizing I knew it was tough to be with a musician. So we would start, you know, we decided we're not going to be together. We're starting to pack up stuff in boxes. Then we'd come across some picture and go, oh, man. Remember um, that day? Yeah. And then, you Aww. know, we'd fall back in love again. Right. And um, I said that to Bob. I said, it's funny. I, I just keep falling in, back in love again with Amy. It's funny. I, well, I didn't think that was going to happen. It's crazy. <laughs> you know, and we started, and it became that song. Uh, every every line of that song is inspired by that those moments of, like, you know, I know I'm it's on the road. but So anyway, the la- <laughs> we're making a John Hall record. And um, and he has, of course, lots of great songs. Oh yeah. And at the at the end of the session, everything, all the mics are on the drums, and I said to him, "Can we just do a quick take of my song? You know, I'm calling it my song. It was me and Bob. Uh, but you know, could we just do this song real quick, just while the mics are up, and get a good demo of it?" And he said, "Well, I don't. Know. We're almost out of time, and I got guitars and everything. Okay, you know." I said, "Thanks." He said, We're, uh, John Troy's not even here. I said, he's out playing Frisbee. Let's, I'll grab him. So we just did one, one quick take of that song. And he, the whole way, John's going, well, well, you don't have a beginning. And I said, well, we'll make it just a, a flare-up beginning. We'll just do a big, you know, like a who sort of beginning and then let it drop into the song. He said, okay. And so <laughs> we, we cut it, and that was that. And then he's back to business, pack up the drums. Thanks. And I said, thanks, everybody. And then four days later, about three in the morning, I get a call from John Hall from Capitol Records. He's out in L.A. Eric, are you sitting? I said, no, I'm lying down in bed. It's two in the morning. He goes, well, he said, they picked your song. And I went, what? what? He said, they, <laughs> Capitol Records picked your song to be the lead hit. I went, that's funny. No, seriously, what? And he said, no, I'm not kidding around. And I said, what? Uh, really? <laughs> you know, I just couldn't believe it. I'm still in disbelief. Uh, and of course, you know, we shared publishing and writing and everything else, and um, you know, and it came out, and it, it was pushed as it. He had a he had a song they had done a demo, a, a video called um, uh, "I Want You to Love uh, Love Me Again." It was called "Love Me Again." And uh, that sounded like a hit song to me. He also had uh, "You You Sure Fooled Me," uh, which was sort of like a car sounding kind of hit, you know, 80s, you know, sort of yep. sign, and that was yep. also good. But um, I think part of it, honestly, Rita, it was because we were kind of off the cuff, mm-hmm. and it had a lot of personality to it. It wasn't, the other songs were also good, but they had a bit of a format to them. You know, this right. was just a diamond in the rough, you know, so. Well, it's so um, cool. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely playing it. I'm playing it, you know, um, in a few minutes, and, and just all the music that you send me is just top-notch. Um Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, great stuff, great stuff. Are you going to write a book or no? I, I say, I, you know, people keep telling me that. I, it's funny, one doesn't often feel, you know, my self-worth of anything interesting, but uh, apparently I, I, maybe I will. It seems like people are interested in the idea of me writing one. Um, I would probably just record into a tape yeah. recorder and do it but i i do you know as you get older uh i have accumulated quite a few stories and uh uh people have mentioned that before i'm, I'm flattered the idea that someone thinks i should write a book well you've <laughs> you've just been all over the world you've played with so many different people and um you know people are interested in stories like that so um uh, yeah 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 sure. put me on that list as well now you also play locally um you play with Vito, yes. our friend Vito. That's right, in Little Rock. Yes. Band, yep. Definitely. Yep. Uh, I had produced and played with Kurt Henry, another great band for yep. quite a while, Big Joe Fitz. Big Joe Fitz is an excellent, you know, low-key R&B band, um, really wonderful. Everybody in that band is great. 
Uh, oh, yeah. Carl Mateo, his band, Mateo Dugan Band, is an excellent band. Excellent. Really good CD. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Time to um, Fly or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a, right. Yeah, yeah. That, that record. Beautiful record. You yeah. know, everything about it is... Uh, I told him, I said, that just needs to land on the right deck. Yeah. It, it'll, it'll be, you know, it'll be a hit record. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, <laughs> do you have any definitive dates that are coming up for you or just kind of, eh, f- not yet? Um, I mostly have record dates coming up, uh-huh. which aren't, you know, publicly yep. attended kind of things. Yes, but, right. Um, you know, I have... Uh, I have a couple of Pusat Dart gigs, uh, a Pusat Dart band. I've been with them since the late 80s because the same bass player I got on the Joe Cocker gig is in the Pusat Dart band. So when Joe would come off the road, he said to me, you know, he, do you want to continue and join the Pusat Dart band? And um, that's been going on now for, I'm probably the last, uh, I'm not an original member, but I've been with them since around 89 or so. That's pretty uh, long, yeah, yeah. Yeah, pretty long time. Yeah. They have. I think he's. We're playing at um, at a wonderful thing we do every year in September. The Mitchell. It's a horse retirement farm in Connecticut, and um, it's always us, Aztec Two Step, and Jonathan Edwards. Oh, nice! And it's just a great. Yeah, every every um, you know kind of end of summer, September. Uh, I think Pusat Dart and the guitarist Jim Chapterlane might be doing some duos at uh, Town Crier. Um, but um, I think my next one on the books might be a veto gig uh, somewhere down in near Poughkeepsie. Uh-huh. Um, I'm looking for my calendar while I'm on the phone <laughs> with you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and people can um, follow you, too. You have a Facebook page, right? Eric Parker on Facebook. Um, and you tell some great stories. You post some great videos that... M- Make most of them, I think you've played in. Not all of them, but some of them. Yes. And um, yeah. so people can follow you on Facebook and see it when you're playing. And um, and that's just... true. Yes. And there's. I'm sorry, I'm not more forthcoming with what. But you know, honestly, with COVID, I haven't been really looking for a lot right. of local dates so yeah. much. Yeah. Um, in these studios, you know, when I was over at uh, my friend Dave Cook's Area 52, Area 52 studio, which is a great name. Uh, his, I was in there one day right when COVID started doing somebody's record. Uh, oh, a great band uh, that will come out soon called the Spirit Brothers. Uh, Ned Levitt, a very good record. It's uh, it's like chanting. It's almost like every song is Tomorrow Never Knows. It's got chanting and harmoniums, but really cool drum beats and percussion too. Oh, nice. Uh, but anyway, at Area Fifty Two, I was there and I said, Dave, you know, I can take my mask off in this drum booth, and he said. You're probably in the safest place in the Hudson Valley yeah. right now. Yeah, I, you know, I, you're isolated, double door. You have a HEPA filter in there. So uh, some of these studios, I kind of locked out with work right when COVID hit. So for, I mean, I like to think it had something to do with my drumming, but I think a lot of it was just safety reasons. Mm-hmm. Keep call Eric again because he was the guy who was in here before, so we don't have new people. Right. You know, it might have been an, an element of that. I think had a factor in it as well. So. Um, and that that's still been going on, you know, so uh, I'm not really sure uh, how many more sessions will go like that. But, you know, who knows? I mean, we're in such a new world now with, these, yeah. you yeah. know, uh, things traveling around. We have to be so careful. It's, it is. It's a, it's a it whole different a world, that's for sure. Well, I tell you, yeah. it, it's been a delight talking with you. I l- realize we could talk for hours more and still not get through all your wonderful stories and all the amazing people that you've played with. You're obviously quite a talent. And um, I do hope you get that Parker brother and your dad band together one more time. And um, it yes. would be really yes. cool to see something like that for sure, because that was a treat. And with the Levin brothers, the whole thing, it was just so cool to see. And oh. Oh, yeah, I'll definitely let you know if that's happening. Oh, please, <laughs> please, please. Yeah. And like I said, just if listeners are, are listening, just Eric Parker on Facebook, just check them out. Just great stories. And um, and I just thank you for your time here today. I'm going to play some, some of the music that you sent me, Eric. And um, it's been a delight and a pleasure. I do hope to see you again soon in person. And um, don't forget, so Jeff Beck is coming. That's right. Maybe we can go together. That Maybe we really can go fun. to that. That would be really fun. Yeah. 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 I love the idea. <laughs> Me too. Thanks so much, Reed. It was wonderful talking to you. And Thanks wonderful so talking with you. To... All right. All right. All right. We'll All right. be in touch. Have a... All right. We'll be in touch. All right. Take care. Thanks All right. Bye bye. All right. Take care. Bye bye. 
91.3 WVKR, Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. That was Mr. Eric Parker, and just so much fun talking with him. If you missed part of all of that interview, or you're just tuning in now, it'll be uploaded tonight on the Local Motion YouTube page, as well as the Facebook page. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to play a track that um, Eric played on, and it happens to really be probably one of my top three favorite songs on the planet. Um Let's take a listen together here. 91.3 WVKR. Ambulance! Ah. I don't want to get too sentimental on you, but my mother, she died a couple of years back, and she said to me, Joe, if I ever go to heaven, I hope it's like Switzerland. And... I haven't taken a walk down the street this morning. I hope she's in a better place than that. No, I do love the place, but you gotta look after it. Don't, don't, you don't do dog shit on the floor. Yeah. Charlie, okay, after I've upset you all, this is a ballad I've sung for a long time, and I mean it sincerely.
Mm, amazing. Folks. 91.3 WVKR, Joe Cocker, live at Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland. We've all heard the song before. You are so beautiful. And the drummer on that was today's guest, Mr. Eric Parker. Wonderful talking with Eric and so many stories to get into that we haven't even scratched the surface. So hopefully he'll come back up on the show sometime. And um, I love that song. It's really honestly one of my top three favorite songs. I think just for me, just the simplicity of it. It just uh, ah, gives me goosebumps, I tell you. Um, now what we're going to play, let's, let's see what else we're going to play. A couple more tracks that Eric played on. So we're going to keep it going here. I think we'll do his top 40 hit with the John Hall band um, that he was telling us about. So this was with the John Hall band, Crazy Keep On Falling. It was released in 1982 and we'll need to take a listen to it right here, right now on 91.3 WVKR.
Yeah, 91.3 WVKR. That was co-written by today's guest, Eric Parker, the John Hall Band. Crazy, Keep on Falling, released back in 1982. Thank you again to Eric Parker for being my guest on the show today. He was a first-time guest, and it was really lovely talking with him, and we'll definitely have to have him back again sometime. Um, There's more music to play of his, but I'm going to play that later on during this hour. You are tuned into Local Motion. I am your host, Rita Ryan here each and every Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. bringing you music of the Hudson Valley. Please subscribe and give a like to the Local Motion on 91.3 WVKR YouTube channel as well as the Facebook page and keep up with everything going on here in the show. And uh, yeah, so we're going to start off now because we start off every non-interview segment with a dedication to Tony Falco, who passed away October 28th of 2021, and he was the owner and started this beautiful venue that continues today at the Falcon in Marlboro. It is now run uh, by his son, Lee, and their family, and um, they, uh, they're they keeping it going. So if um, anybody out there is listening, wondering how you can honor the Falcon, go there go see a show, have dinner, and support live music because that's what Tony would want us all to do. So Tony left us with a playlist on Spotify and every single show that I'd host here since his passing, I um, I play a track from his playlist and it just kind of makes me feel like Tony's right there and, you know, giving us his playlist like he did before the shows at the Falcon. So this is a great track and um, I'll stop talking. I'll let you listen to some music that was on Tony Falco's playlist. And this one's by Randy Newman, 91.3 WVKR. Princess, the night we met with your hair piled up high, I will never forget. I'm drunk right now, baby, but I've got to be. I never could tell you. First time I saw you, and I always will love you, Marie. I loved you the first time I saw you, and I always will. That the trees sing when the wind blows. Your flower, your river, your rainbow. Sometimes I'm crazy, but I guess you know. I'm weak and I'm lazy, and I hurt you so. I don't listen to a word you say when you're in trouble.
goes down. That's what makes the world go round. When your baby's sad and you got a frown, make her happy with ten toes up and ten toes down. Yeah. That's what makes the world go round. After all, the world will be a much better place with all the fools and clowns messing up the place. Now the question of black, white, or brown it goes up and ten toes down. Yeah, that's what makes the world go round. Now the question, black, white, or brown WVKR, that's Chris Beard. Chris Beard and Joe Beard are going to be playing at the Falcon on August 11th. We just heard the track called Ten Toes Up, live at thefalcon.com. Got it started here with this segment for a track for Tony Falco from his playlist that he left us, Randy Newman. The Randy Newman Songbook Volume 1 is the name of the album, and the track we heard was Marie. Great, great songwriter, Mr. Randy Newman. And we'll keep the music flowing here. Another gentleman that will be performing at the Falcon this Friday is this gentleman right here. Let's take a listen now to Arlen Roth, 
91.3 WVKR Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. Mr. Arlen Roth Slide Guitar Summit. And we heard the track featuring Cindy Cash Dollar, Stranger on the Shore. Arlen Roth, one of the masters of the Telecaster, ArlenRoth.com. He'll be performing at the Falcon this Friday night, live at thefalcon.com. You don't need to buy tickets to go to the Falcon. It's all done by reservations, so you just give them a call or do it online. Again, the website, live at thefalcon.com. They always have an incredible lineup, and uh, you can't go wrong seeing some music there, that's for sure. So let's keep it going. Gentleman Dylan Doyle has played there many times. He's got a gig coming up in Pine Plains at the Stissing Center. Let's take a listen right now to Dylan here on 91.3. Amphetamines 
All the long short tents they bleed Through a cracked club upon the wheel Out in California You'll find the sun He's with you. 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 He's with you.